Good afternoon. Welcome to the Federal Fiscal Checkup, the prognosis for Canada's economic health. I'm Michael Curran from the Ottawa Business Journal, and we have a great show planned for you today. Thank you for attending. Of course, we're focused on the federal government's fiscal update that was delivered on Monday. Our promise to you uh, during this broadcast is this. You will be much more informed about the state of the country's finances and what they might mean for you. It's my pleasure to co-host today's event. Let me introduce my partner, Su Ling Ching, the president and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade. Hey, Su Ling. Hello, Michael. Thank you for being here and uh, welcome to everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, of course, today is a bit of a replacement event for us because typically we'd be meeting in person for our uh, event in the spring when the federal government typically presents its annual budget. But of course, because of the pandemic, we didn't have that this year. Yeah, the pandemic uh, interrupted those plans. So this event is typically called the post-budget breakfast. Now it's more of a uh, pandemic virtual lunch. Uh, so hope some of you guys are grabbing a That's bite to eat over this uh, uh, over this noon hour. I'll tell you what hasn't changed though. Lots changed about this broadcast and since the pandemic hit, but uh, uh, we do have uh, a great event planned for you. And we have a lineup of great experts uh, to provide some analysis on the federal government's fiscal positions, uh, new tax measures, and also its uh, spending priorities. Uh, but before we go to those speakers, Su Ling, let me maybe ask you this. Why do you think the, the fiscal update was an important one to follow? Well, I think it's really important for all of us. As you know, the federal government has been our soft place to fall during this pandemic, but business and community leaders need to plan. And so we need to be able to provide some context for them uh, in order to do that. So the clarity on where we are and what our priorities are, give us an idea of what's already been done and what we want to continue to work on. And, you know, during this time, we have witnessed an exceptional level of collaboration among business and all levels of government and our rebound and our ability to thrive in a new economy will depend on continuing this partnership and making sure that we do have a clear picture of what our plans are. Yeah, it's a it's a great point. And and taking that local perspective, as we often do at the Ottawa Business Journal, Sue Ling, uh, you know, there's an expression that's usually used uh, in, in talking about Canada, U.S. trade, but it, it I'll just adjust it here. And I'll say, if the federal government sneezes, Ottawa can get a cold. You know, what I mean by that, of course, is that if there are some belt tightening to be done, or, or any changes in gov government spending, uh, they will be reflected here in the local economy through public service jobs, through discretionary spending in the local economy. So this is really, really important stuff. Um, before we introduce our main uh, speaker today, let me uh, recognize uh, a couple of the companies that are partnering with us on this event. Our lead sponsor is MNP. MNP is one of Canada's leading national accounting, tax, and business consulting firms. It serves and responds to the needs of clients in the public, private, and not-for-profit sectors. MNP has an increasingly large presence here in Ottawa. Its office is located in uh, on Carling Avenue in the old Corel Corp, the gold uh, office there. Uh, and of course, MNP is led in Ottawa by Michael Demetrio. A special shout out to him. Excellent. And uh, our second sponsor today is Impact Public Affairs, who I think has been an ongoing sponsor. Uh, it was founded in 1997. Impact Public Affairs is a full service government relations and communications firm based right here in Ottawa with offices across Canada. No other public affairs firm has the depth of experience and track record of success in ensuring that its strategies allow organizations to deliver effective messages to government officials, the public and key stakeholders. And I'll be thrilled to be joined in just a few minutes by their president, Hugh Williams. And a final shout out goes to the global event partner for Ottawa Business Events, Oakwood Designed and Built. Oakwood's a fun company. I'm always fascinated by uh, local history here. Oakwood's a fourth generation family business. It was founded way back in 1956 by a German immigrant to Canada who had a hard work ethic and was trained in woodworking. Today, the company's a state of the art home renovation and custom builder led by serial entrepreneur John Liptak and his two daughters. It's uh, known for embracing new building technology a big thank you to Oakwood Design and Build. So a quick uh, overview on what uh, viewers can expect today. 
Uh, we're going to kick off with Mona Forche, the MP for Ottawa Vanier, also Minister of Middle Class Prosperity and Associate Minister of Finance. She will provide a five minute overview of Monday's federal fiscal update. Then Su Ling and Hugh Williams from Impact Public Affairs will conduct a 15 minute question and answer session with the minister. Next up is Gavin Miranda, the MNP regional tax leader. Gavin is going to provide an analysis on what the federal fiscal update means for local businesses. And we conclude with a fun and dynamic panel discussion that includes Lanny Westerson, uh, joining us all the way from Calgary. Uh, Lanny's a MNP partner and specialist in government uh, affairs uh, advisor, and also the chief economist of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, uh, Trevin Stratton. So that's going to be a fun way to kick things off, uh, or pardon me, wrap things up, I should say, Su Ling. Uh, I'm going to duck out now, and you can introduce uh, Minister Monia Forte. Over to you, Su Ling. Thanks, Michael. We'll see you later. It is uh, now my pleasure to introduce Mona Fortier. Elected in 2017, the Honourable Mona Fortier is the first female member of Parliament for Ottawa Vanier. Minister Fortier has always believed that she can best serve our community by getting involved in taking action. Her expertise covers the area of healthcare, education, job creation, and francophone affairs. Prior to being elected, Minister Forte worked as the Chief Director of Communications and Market Development at College La Cité and managed her own strategic communications firm. She has also served on several not-for-profit uh, board of directors, including Montfort Hospital, the Ontario Provincial Advisory Committee on Francophone Affairs, and the Shaw Centre. In addition, she has received numerous awards for her community involvement, including the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012. Minister Fortier is focused on making life more affordable for Canadians, protecting the environment and helping businesses prosper. She's a strong advocate for linguistic duality and always searches for the right balance between prosperity and social justice. As a mother of three, a University of Ottawa graduate, community leader and entrepreneur, Mr. Forte knows that it is important to come together with an ambitious plan to build stronger and better communities while growing the middle class. Nice to see you again, Minister, over to you. Well, uh, good afternoon or good lunch to all of you. Um, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from Ottawa on the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. Now, thank you for that introduction, uh, Su Ling. Thank you, Michael and Hugh, for uh, having me uh, back today and for all uh, that you have done to support our community, our businesses through this pandemic. Merci beaucoup de m'avoir invité à cette assemblée virtuelle. Il me fait plaisir de venir discuter des nouveaux investissements prévus dans le cadre de l'énoncé économique de l'automne 2020. It is uh, my pleasure to be here today to discuss our government's plan to continue supporting businesses, families and workers here in Ottawa and across Canada, and our plan to build back better as we presented in the 2020 fall economic statement. Now, so far, our federal government has provided more than eight out of every $10 spent in Canada to fight COVID-19 and support Canadians. We have invested $322 billion in direct measures to fight the virus and support Canadians and Canadian businesses. We will continue to take the steps needed to protect Canadians while ensuring our economy is ready and able to respond once the pandemic is over. Now, these measures are about more than just keeping businesses afloat. They are about people. People like Luc Régimbal and Stéphane Giroux here in Ottawa, the owners of Régimbal Promotion, which I visited with the Prime Minister a few months ago. They were able to hire back staff, retool, and produce cloth face masks, thanks to the former commercial rent program and the wage subsidy. Two programs which we have adapted and extended to support businesses and main streets here in Ottawa and across the country. Des gens comme Stéphane Giroux et Luc Régimbal, le propriétaire ou les propriétaires de production Régimbal ici à Ottawa, une entreprise que j'ai pris le temps de visiter avec le premier ministre 
et qui ont pu utiliser nos outils pour réembaucher euh, leurs travailleurs, pour pouvoir avoir un prêt et pour pouvoir utiliser euh, les fonds qu'on avait pour le loyer. On fait en sorte que cette entreprise a pu continuer à faire des affaires pendant la pandémie. Every single loan, rent subsidy and wage subsidy has meant businesses being able to keep their lights on and their staff on the payroll. We are committed to bringing businesses and Canadians through this pandemic with our support. Chaque prêt, chaque subvention d'aide au loyer et subvention salariale a permis à beaucoup d'entreprises de garder leurs portes ouvertes et de garder leurs employés sur leur liste de paie. Nous savons et nous sommes engagés à soutenir les entreprises et les Canadiennes et les Canadiens avec nos mesures au travers de cette pandémie. In the fall economic statement, we made several announcements that businesses and even you, Suling, have called for in the past few months. That is because every step of the way, we have been listening and we know that businesses still need support. We announced that we will be increasing the maximum Canada emergency wage subsidy rate to 75% beginning December 20th until March 2021. We also announced that we are extending the Canada Emergency Business Account and the Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy Loan to March 2021. Importantly, we also announced that we will be rolling out a brand new government-backed loan program for some of the hardest hit sectors like tourism, hospitality, and arts and culture. And we know they've been hit hard in Ottawa as well as 25% of the $500 million top up to regional developed agencies being specifically allocated to tourism sector. So FedDev will have that program. Il est important de mentionner que nous avons également annoncé un tout nouveau programme de prêts garantis par le gouvernement pour venir en aide à certains secteurs qui ont été les plus durement touchés, tels que le tourisme, l'hôtellerie et les arts et la culture. Looking beyond direct supports for small businesses, we also announced next steps on implementing a Canada-wide early learning and childcare system, a $1 billion commitment in improving long-term care and support infection prevention and an additional $93 million investment to support mental health care. I know that is something that really came out in businesses in, in Ottawa, mental health care. All of these measures will go a long way to support those who have been most dramatically impacted by this pandemic so we can come back stronger when we get to the other side. While we are still focused on protecting the health and safety of Canadians through this pandemic, we announced that once we defeat this virus, our government is prepared to invest up to $100 billion over the next three years, which represents 3 to 4% of GDP, to help accelerate our economic recovery. Now, this stimulus will make the economy greener, more inclusive, and more competitive. The heart of this stimulus plan will be smart, time-limited investments that can act fast to jumpstart the recovery and have a long-run value by creating shared prosperity, improving Canadians' quality of life, and powering our green transformation. And we look forward to saying more about this in Budget 2021. En conclusion, les Canadiens seront confrontés à un hiver difficile. Mais il y a maintenant de la lumière au bout du tunnel. We are in for a very difficult winter but spring is just on the other side. We are in the middle of a second wave and many here in Ontario, and especially in Ottawa, are facing renewed lockdown measures and we must work together to combat this virus. And I know that many of you are tired, are eager for a vaccine. And I want to assure you that we have the most diverse and extensive portfolio of vaccine candidates in the world. And every Canadian can be confident that they will have access to an effective, free vaccine once it's ready. Comme nous l'avons dit depuis le début, notre gouvernement est là pour vous. Nous avions promis de mettre tout en œuvre pour soutenir les Canadiens. C'est ce que nous faisons aujourd'hui et c'est ce que nous continuerons de faire. 
And thank you very much for this opportunity for exchanging with you today. And uh, I know we're all in this together. So uh, the government of Canada did say on Monday that we have your back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Forte. And uh, thank you for all the hard work that you're doing in your role uh, through this pandemic and for making time to be here with us today. This isn't even the first time I've seen you in the last two days, you've had a busy week. Uh, we do have a few questions that were submitted by our members and to help me pose these questions, we'd like to welcome the president of Impact Public Affairs, Hugh Williams, to join us. Yeah. Great. Uh, Great. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. And you know, let me say right off the top how nice it is to have uh, two female ministers, not just as the Minister of Finance, but also as the Associate Minister of Finance. So as the father of three daughters, it's always it's always great to see the, the, the gender uh, equation uh, so elegantly handled by the government. Um, I want to say first off that the, the bounce that I'm getting across the country from and not just in the national capital region from from business leaders is that the government really did step up. And I think it's important to, to, to thank you at this point in time. Um, for all the hard work, not just by yourself, but I think Ottawa should be very proud of the public servants who have been available. A lot of Canadians and business leaders don't know how available they've been to talk to business groups over the weekend, late into the night. It's not unusual for political staff and for, for our, our leaders to really uh, to, to be there. But I just wanted to start off by asking you, you know, what's your what's what's the kind of bounce you're getting as you're talking to 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 business leaders here in Ottawa and across the country? Well, uh, great question. I think that uh, everybody is very eager to get on the other side. That's what yeah. I'm thinking. And, and also eager of what will recovery mean. And what I've been trying to, of course, say, and I believe that's what we have said as a government, is we need to get this phase and pandemic defeated before we can really put forward recovery. And uh, I will say that the government uh, has been, and you mentioned it, the public servants have been incredible in working so hard uh, with us, of course, to develop, implement, and bring forward support for businesses, for workers, for Canadian families, um, to make sure that we can bridge uh, through uh, the pandemic, especially now in this second wave, and to be ready for recovery. So I would tell you that I believe it was it was well received. There's a lot of questions. Of course, there's a, still a lot of uncertainties. Um, the second wave is making us work harder. But if we all uh, work together to plank that second wave and, and try to get over that hump, and defeat the virus uh, with, uh, of course, the vaccine that is coming, I think that recovery will be um, possible. Yeah, those two things are so tied together. We can't have the economy run unless we defeat the virus. So I think the, the, the emphasis is really uh, uh, positive there. Um, one of the central questions as we uh, polled members on this was the, was the question of debt. I mean, obviously the, the prime minister has talked about this is the right time for the government of Canada to take on, on debt versus individual Canadians. Um, just to, I wonder if you'd, you'd talk a little bit about the guardrails or or viewpoint on how debt will be handled going forward in, in the future, because the government's been all in in terms of making sure that we have the the uh, the, the, the the spend to defeat the virus. Well, a uh, great question. Of course, um, you know, the federal government has provided so far more than eight dollars of every ten dollars spent in Canada to fight COVID-19 and support Canadians. And, you know, Canada was in a very positive situation at the beginning, and we know that we'll be able to weather it and come back stronger. But we also know that those supports were, we were needed. If we didn't give those supports, it would have been on the shoulders of Canadians that that uh, debt would be taken. So we chose to take it. We're working with provinces and territories, of course, trying to collaborate to bring forward the support. And I will tell you, um, we will go through this. And you know, we also have um, the the strongest um, fiscal position in the G7. We still do, and we will get over this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, and I would say to people that were asking that question, go to the budget. There's some really interesting charts that show the show the history of of, of deficit in Canada and debt, and and actually kind of help frame how we're, we're not. It's it's not as a uh, as alarming as as it as it could be. Um, Maybe too, sorry, I, I yeah. just remembered. I forgot something. I was trying to find sure. it. Um, we've, we've um got uh, you know eighty percent of the jobs back. 
since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, when uh, I thought you were talking about guardrails, you heard me, Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Finance uh, Freeland say, you know, unemployment, uh, employment rates and hours work will be three uh, guardrails that we will be looking at. Why? Because we have to look at people. We have to look at job security. That will be key into recovery. And uh, also the fact that um, with the three to four percent GDP um, uh, stimulus package, so up to a hundred billion, we will have to make sure that by creating that one million jobs that we uh, we committed to, um, it'll be people. So that's those are guardrails that we've been looking at to make sure that we know where Canadians are in the in the job market. Awesome. We had we had a, uh, several members ask about the retrofit program, the energy retrofit program. I know there's two point six billion dollars committed there, which is also a, you know kind of a stimulus as well as a, a, a green initiative and, and another um, one hundred and fifty million dollars for the community ventilation systems. A uh, lot a lot of uh, people in the uh, HVAC world, uh, and but also just every business person worried about that. And I know the the National Association uh, HRA, who represents the, the that that sector, um, you know, came out and really. Uh, gave the government a lot of credit for that but any any thoughts behind the thinking behind that and how that's going to roll out well the the rolling out is uh, of course uh, everybody's trying uh, the speed of lightning to get these programs out so i'm hopeful that it'll be sooner uh, that we can go forward we will um you know buildings including our homes account for 17 17 percent of canada's greenhouse gas emissions so helping canadians make their homes more energy efficient can support our environmental objectives while making homes more comfortable and more affordable to maintain and these will be able for us to create good middle-class jobs in the communities. The energy efficiency sector accounted for more than 436,000 direct jobs in 2018. And also uh, by the government providing 2.6 billion over seven years, starting in 2021, to Natural Resources Canada to help homeowners improve their home energy efficiency by providing up to 700,000 grants of up to $5,000 to help homeowners uh, make energy efficient improvements in their homes. Uh, these uh, grants will be eligible and retroactive to December 1st, 2020. So we have to yeah. keep that in mind. Uh, amazing. Uh, I'll bring Sue Ling into the conversation here. I know she and I talked before the session about how much we're hearing from tourism and hotels in, in terms of the, the positive impact of the of the fall economic statement. But it's a big deal, Sue Ling, here in, in, in Ottawa as, as one of the major pillars. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as the nation's capital, tourism is one of our key drivers. And, uh, and so, Minister, how do you feel about how the budget will impact that for Ottawa here? Well, again, um, I have to tell you that you know we still have to get over this uh, pandemic, uh, and I know tourism uh, is very affected. Hospitality also, and I mentioned also the arts and culture. We have provided supports for you know a suite of um, of um, programs and supports for businesses. Uh, we talked about SIBA, the wage subsidy, and also the um, rent subsidy. But we also knew that sectors like tourism and the hospitality were mostly hurt, mostly affected, I should use the word <laughs> affected. And that's why we've provided through the um, Fed, Fed Dev uh, in our region, uh, a top up of um, a certain amount, it'll be 500,000, 500 million provided for all um, agencies. So Fed Dev will have part of it. And a top up will also um, help uh, those sectors and 25% of that will be directed to the tourism sector. So we know that that will help. It won't solve everything. We'll have to all work together to make sure that uh, we go through this pandemic. But I believe that we are starting to show that some sectors that were mostly affected are receiving uh, new types of support. Yeah, Maybe. and that has to be our priority going forward is targeted investments in those sectors the most hit to get to the other side. Sorry, Hugh, I cut you off. No, no, but that's great. I want to say <laughs> thank you so much because, uh, you know, we've been talking for the past, well, during the whole pandemic, and the fact that businesses have provided us with uh, concerns, with ideas, made it where those solutions are out there because we worked all together on this. 
so maybe one rapid fire question and then I'll, I'll leave it to Suling to, to thank you. So I'll thank you in advance for, for all, all your hard work. Um, but you mentioned uh, infection uh, prevention and, and control. I mean, a historic investment of a, of a billion dollars. Uh, I mean, that's an area that that's important and also mental health. Like you, you, I mean, you just didn't focus on vaccines. You, you made sure to hit two other areas. I just wondered if you wanted to expand on the thinking uh, behind those and, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Suling. Well, we know that our long-term care system was affected like we never thought it was. And we can't blame one province or we can't blame the federal government. We all have to blame each other for this and we need to step up. So the government said, you know what, we're going to step up. We're going to invest a billion dollars to make sure that we work with provinces and territories to support the long-term care uh, system. And that is something that we are dedicated to do. The second thing, mental health, I believe that's the invisible pandemic uh, with all this. And Absolutely. Uh, we're all touched by it. Even myself, I find it, you know, hard. So we have to make sure that uh, mental health supports are out there, that we take this seriously, because I know many workers, many employers, uh, kids, uh, seniors are, are going through this. And that's why we decided to continue to invest. And I sure we'll have to do more. Uh, but uh, at this time, mental health is part of the solution. Thank Great, you. thank you. We we appreciate that. And that's, there's one thing that we learned is that health and the economy are completely connected and that we have to address them as a holistic approach uh, to community prosperity. And uh, there are a lot of opportunities coming out of this for us to uh, focus in on areas that maybe needed focus before, but have definitely been highlighted. So thank you for being here, Minister. We appreciate your time, Hugh. A pleasure to, uh, to be here with you today. And thank you for your ongoing support. And I'm sure we'll be speaking with both of you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you for being thank here. Thank you very much. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, that presentation by the minister and the questions. Thank you to all of our, our members who uh, submitted questions and, of course, to Hugh, who is an expert in this field, for being here with us today. It is now time for our expert analysis of the federal fiscal update provided by Gavin Morand. He is the regional tax leader with MNP in the Eastern Ontario region, and he has more than 20 years of experience helping public and private companies with their tax compliance, tax consulting, and tax provisioning needs. He's worked with clients in a variety of industries, including the restaurant and hotel sectors, helping them with their business models and domestic and international tax considerations. Gavin is a CPA and chartered accountant designated in 2001, graduated from the University of Waterloo with a master's in accounting and specializing in taxation. In 1999, after achieving a Bachelor of Arts in 1998. Welcome, Gavin. Thank you for being here today and take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it and I'm happy to be here to present to you guys with regards to what the tax measures were in the economic statement that was announced. So as we know, the government has taken large steps in helping Canadians and the economy. And one of the things that has come out in the last little while is that they have spent a significant amount of money because it was warranted at the time. You see that this government has spent more money because they needed to support Canadians. And the deficit currently is the largest that we've seen since the Great Depression. Now, the government has spent over, projected to spend about $380 billion. And that's going to continue into fiscal 21 and 22, with the debt looking to be at about $1.2 trillion in, in aggregate. Now, having said that, as Minister Fortier, Minister Fortier noted, the government did see the job losses. There was about 3 million job losses with the start of the pandemic. And by October, because of the various programs that were introduced, 80% of those jobs had been recovered. So the government has taken large steps to help the government, to help the people rather. Now, the first thing that the I'll touch on is the personal tax measures that were announced. So one of the things that the government continues to do is to support Canadians and additional amounts are going to be provided for childcare benefits. If you have ch children under the age of six, 
and your income is less than $120,000, there's going to be an additional $1,200 available to you, and that's going to be paid in four installments. If your income is above that, there's going to be an additional $600 available to you as soon as the legislation is passed. So that's the government, again, helping Canadians in their time of need. The second aspect that's very welcome, as you'll see, you know, Sue Ling's working from home. You can see myself at working from home as well, is the home office expense deduction. There has been a, an agreement usually between an employer and an employee if they work from home that they provide a, a deduction and that allows the person to claim some of the costs of their home. The government is gonna relieve some of the pressure on this and say, instead of getting some of the paperwork that you need to do, the T, it's called a T2200, they're gonna simplify the process and not require that. In addition, they're gonna give a flat $400 for everyone to deduct, depending on how much you work from home. So that's something that's very welcome to the taxpayers. It eases the burden of having to go out and buy an extra monitor, an extra desk, so on and so forth. More details are forthcoming, but that is a very welcome change for a lot of people, certainly here in the Ottawa area and across the country. The other thing I'll note is there, the government had mentioned in the prior and as well in the throne speech in September that they were going to continue to make changes to the stock option plan. And for those of you in the, in the tech area in Ottawa, know that this is a very vital aspect of compensating employees because tech companies are just not cash rich. So providing them with the ability to get equity in the company provides incentive and allows them to attract talent. These stock options, provided you meet certain rules, allow you to effectively tax the gain that you realize from this option as a capital gain and not as income. So there's a significant benefit. You know, 50% of your tax is saved on this. So what they're planning to do is for those companies who have revenues in excess of $500 million, their employees are going to be limited to $200,000 of benefit per year. So this will impact large companies, the large public companies, some of which benefited when they were smaller companies, like private Canadian corporations or CCPCs. They will still get the access to this benefit to attract talent and companies with revenues of less than $500 million. So it's good to see that the safe harbors were put into place. And as Minister Fortier noted, that Budget 2021 is going to lay out a framework for our national child care program coast to coast. They also introduced some corporate tax measures. Some of you will recall that the job losses that were then recouped were largely probably in part because of the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy that allowed people to, to bring people back. This program has been extended now into June and the rate has gone up. It was 65%, it's gone up to 75%. So the government did extend it and increase it. The 75% is an additional 10% top up that will come on this top of amount for companies that have really taken a hit meaning they've got 70% decline in revenue or not. The other program is the Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy. The prior program called the SECRA, we saw while provided support, didn't have a huge amount of uptick. This program I know from speaking with my clients is much more welcome. It operates on the same basis as the Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy, which means that depending on your revenue decline, you can get 65% of your subsidy, rent subsidized, or if you own the, your property, mortgage interest, property taxes, and other items. Again, this has been extended into March with this. So there will be a good amount of support that will be provided. And the lockdown support extension will also be available, meaning that the government will provide an additional 25% if you have experienced a lockdown because of a public health order. So that's if you add those three up, you can get up to approximately 90% support from the government. So please take advantage of these programs. And finally, the Canada Emergency Business Account. In addition to the $40,000 that was previously announced for the businesses, $10,000 of which is forgivable if you repay it by December 31st, 2022, they've now allowed for an additional $20,000 of funds, half of which $10,000 is forgivable if you repay it by December 31st, 2022. And again, the application deadline was moved to December 31st, 2020, but now has been extended to March 2021. So do take advantage of these programs to help your businesses. And the question, the final item that we'll talk about as well, the government also needs to raise a bit of revenue to deal with this. And how are they going to do that? In their throne speech, they talked about taxing digital giants. And one of the things that came through loud and clear in the economic statement is how they propose to do that. First, I'll talk about quickly 
that the government has zero rated supplies of PPE, which is welcome. And that means you're not going to pay HST on these items after December 6th. When I talk about these other three items, they're really for the big, large companies. You'll see that the economy is becoming more of a digital economy. E-commerce and digital supplies, I call this the Netflix tax. If you think of companies like Netflix that provide content into Canada, we're, we're allowed sometimes to get to get allowed not to pay not to pay HST or charge HST, which gave them a competitive advantage compared to Canadians trying to sell that same product or service. The same thing applies to third-party distribution and fulfillment warehouses. Think of this as the Amazon or Etsy, where somebody would be able to provide this good or service through this third-party warehouse and be able to, to have a competitive advantage because they didn't have to charge that HST and therefore their price would be lower. Now, having them charge that HST puts them on a more level playing field with Canadian companies that have to that provide the same product. And finally, they've looked at what I call now the Airbnb tax. So platform-based short-term accommodations for those people that are renting out a room or other aspects of you know, buying a property and renting it out, you're gonna have to make sure that you adhere to the rules of the HST as well. A lot of this was not being charged appropriately, so just be aware that that's coming. These are gonna be effective July, 2021, and except for the PPE, which is December 6th. So the last thing I'll mention is that the government is looking to make sure that the companies are compliant with the programs and not taking advantage of them. So they are committing $600 million to audits to make sure that those people that are taking advantage of the programs really are playing by the rules. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Michael. Thank you very much. Well, Gavin, uh, that was a great job. So succinct and so practical. You know, when I, I think of um, federal uh, bu government budgets or fiscal updates, as we had on Monday, uh, they are by their very net nature, very technical documents. We need our friends in the accounting profession like you, Gavin, uh, to break things down in terms of, you know, what they really mean for entrepreneurs. So we appreciate your time today and the support MNP has uh, provided us with today. You're a great partner. Have a great day, Gavin. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. So uh, we're very excited now to uh, head into our final segment. Uh, which is our uh, panel discussion. And uh, I'll introduce, uh, without further ado, our, our first panelist. Uh, we have Lanny Westersund. Lanny is a partner from MNP. He's joining us today from Calgary. Uh, uh, Lanny is a senior advisor in government affairs. He uh, has 20 years of experience providing strategic advice on government policy and political matters. He is a graduate of the University of Calgary, specializing in poli sci and history. I've, I've specialized in one of those. Uh, welcome to Lanny. Thanks for joining us. Oh, and we'll get your uh, audio fixed there in, in just a second, Lanny. Hold, hold tight as we're as we're fixing that. Oh, we'll bring there, on. That, that, yeah, there, there, there we go. Phone. Yeah, you're there. And, you're um, there. We got you. And perfect. our second uh, our second panelist is the chief economist and vice president at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. He is an award winning business economist specializing in global and technological change. He helps uh, organizations identify and manage opportunities arising from trends that are reshaping industry and international business. Boy, do we need some advice on that. He studied at uh, Carleton University, that's my alma mater in Canada, as well as the London School of Economics in the UK, and a Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Switzerland, where he obtained his PhD. Please welcome Dr. Trevin Stratton. How are you doing, Trevin? I'm doing well. How are you, Michael? Good. We always uh, appreciate you making some time for us. Listen, Lanny, I'm going to uh, kick off with you. Uh, MNP, uh, as do many accounting firms, made a formal submission to the Standing Committee on Finance to help update before it was announced. Uh, so I want to take you back in time a little bit, Lanny, and let's roll back the clock. And, and let me ask you this. What did MNP ask for? And uh, did the federal government deliver? Well, th thanks, Michael. And first off, I'd like to thank you and, and Trevin and all of our participants, including their uh, minister, in doing this. It's a great honor to be here. And MNP was excited to have two of the spots allocated by you folks. And for all our guests and attendees watching, wish you health and happiness and that you get through COVID safely. Um, 
my answer to your question, I guess, is in kind of three parts. Um, and the first part is we are extremely grateful uh, and commend the government that they uh, provided business and Canadians with much needed emergency financial support in this time of the pandemic crisis. Uh, at the same time, the amendments do demonstrate how complex our tax system and government programs are. Uh, and easing the administrative and financial burden uh, put on Canadians in business to access and comply with the programs uh, may allow uh, for more Canadians uh, to access these program supports. With respect to some of the tax changes that we have heard about and anticipate might be coming, those have been put off into uh, uh, the spring. And, um, you know, so we're waiting a little bit with bated breath, uh, but we want to continue to ensure and urge the government um, to maintain a globally competitive tax uh, system. Yeah. As, as the third point, there are some things um, that I think we hope to see in the coming days as we transition to build back better into recovery, and those will only be kind of assessed with the passage of time. Okay, we need a little bit more time for those. Well, thanks, thanks for kicking this off, Trevin. Let's go to you, and and I I want to really get down into some of the details, but I'm going to start off with a kind of the big sweeping. Uh, uh, question, uh, Trevin, which is what is your overall reaction to the fiscal update? We waited for months and months and months and months and we got it. And you think what? Well, I think it's important to, to put it in context too. So, you know, we were the last big event or announcement we had from the government on their economic response was the speech from the throne, which was at the end of, uh, of September. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of big announcements in there, uh, you know, about interprovincial trade barriers, uh, you know, about an actual economic recovery plan that we didn't yet have the details or the numbers related to it. Um, what happened in the interim between the speech from the throne and, and the fall economic statement um, is, is the second wave. Um, and so I, I imagine, you know, what we saw on Monday was very much a focus on the pandemic itself and on emergency measures themselves as well. Um, but I imagine, you know, we'll probably see a more robust economic recovery package in the uh, in a budget early next year. Um, and so, you know, when I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the actual announcements that were made on Monday in the Paul economic statement, um, certainly there were a lot of things that, that were good for business and an improvement on the current situation, um, including the uh, the top up of the Canada wage subsidy up to 75 percent, which is where it was um, in the, uh, during the first wave, um, which the Canadian Chamber has been advocating for and is, is appreciated by a number of different businesses, particularly small businesses, too. Um, the extension of that, the extension of the uh, of the rent subsidy as well, uh, including the changes that were previously made um, is is very useful. Uh, obviously, one of the big takeaways is the um, is is the fiscal update. Um, you know, we haven't actually had uh, a, an update on the government's fiscal position since July. Um, so, you know, a three hundred eighty one billion dollar deficit is historically large. Um, and you know what's going to be very interesting, and also you know earmarking another hundred billion dollars um, for for next year in, in the budget too. Um, what will be very interesting is first of all seeing uh, you know we had an idea of fiscal guardrails, looking at employment, but there are no real red lines there when it comes to government spending. To, so to see what what those might actually be, um, and to also see what what is going to be spent on, because certainly uh, not all spending is equal. Some types of spending will have uh, a greater impact. On, on economic growth and competitiveness than others. Um, and so we're still awaiting uh, some of those details too, um, including, you know, one-time emergency spending or, or deficits this year, um, you know, were, were necessary to support a lot of businesses and individual Canadians. Whether those will turn into structural deficits with new program spending uh, is a big question that's out there. Uh, Lanny, uh, we'll we'll go back to you now, and and uh, you know when uh, thank you by the way for joining us all the way to Calgary, Lanny. When I when I think of Calgary and Alberta in general these days, you know I'm I'm so concerned about the oil and gas sectors, so concerned about uh, the entrepreneurs and businesses that are suffering out there. So I wanted to ask you, MMP is so connected to entrepreneurs, you know they are the the, the bulk of your clients. Do you think all entrepreneurs are getting what they need from the federal government, e either in this fiscal update or or overall? Um, I I think it it it, it depends um, on the industry, and and there are, as the minister notes. Um, some gaps and 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 government uh, keeps trying to address those gaps. But one of the things that I think uh, 
being a Western Canadian that I see is the hope that we uh, enable responsible resource development um, because that is going to be the key in Saskatchewan and Alberta and BC and, uh, and other places uh, to build back better uh, in a responsible way with, with renewable energy and also traditional energy um, at the forefront. One of the challenges that I think we identified in, in one of our submissions earlier this year was that many businesses were left because of the, the passive income changes in 2017 without a rainy day fund. And so the requirement um, that the federal government had to support them would have been lessened if uh, the passive income rules change, uh, changes had been less dramatic. And I think um, the passive investment rules for CCPs uh, has exacerbated a system where we could have made Canadians and Canadian business owners less reliant on the programs if we had been less stringent in uh, those policies leading up to the pandemic. Okay. Um, and Trevin, I, I want to give you an opportunity. We last spoke in a virtual event, I think it was September or so, that was uh, before um, uh, the House had uh, had wrapped up its session before the throne speech. We hadn't didn't have a fiscal update, and maybe most significantly, Trevin, we didn't have the pro prospect of vaccines on the horizon. So um, I know it's always impossible, and people must be pitching questions to you as a chief economist, Trevin. But if you look towards 2021, uh, given what we know now, so we've got the throne speech, we got the fiscal update, and we we might have three or four vaccines on the horizon. Uh, how optimistic are you uh, about an economic recovery in in 2021? So I think, you know, if everything goes according to plan, um, you know, first of all, we should say it's probably going to be a, a pretty tough winter for a lot of small businesses, particularly in those hardest hit sectors um, when it comes to restaurants, accommodation, retail to to a certain extent, uh, certainly when it when it comes to energy as well. Um, but, you know, with, with the timeline, you know, we're, we're looking forward to to economic recovery, ideally beginning, uh, you know, kind of around the late spring um, and continuing for the rest of the year. I mean, when it comes to economic growth, we're looking at somewhere above probably 4% growth right now uh, when it comes to Canada's GDP next year, uh, or at least those are what the projections are. Of course, that still won't make up for what we lost this year. Um, so in terms of the timeline, we, you know, we certainly saw what was announced on Monday. Uh, the Bank of Canada's most recent monetary policy report, um, you know, also provided a, a bit of a projection. Um, and we're not looking to full recovery uh, until at least the beginning of 2022. Our, the, the size of our economy will not be back to its pre-pandemic size until early 2022. Um, and when it comes to actual economic production, um, you know, our output, that, that won't be back to normal until late 2022 as well. Um, and also, you know, the Bank of Canada is certainly signaling that interest rates are gonna remain at their current historical lows uh, until 2023 as well. Um, so what we know or what has changed, I suppose, from, from the first wave, um, is that the actual economic impact this year is actually projected to be less than was initially thought. Um, but if we're looking forward, uh, you know, but what else is new and look, looking forward to next year and the year after, um, is that it's going to be much more prolonged than was initially thought to. Um, so we're looking at a very long-term economic recovery period, but certainly, um, you know, with, with the vaccine and, and approval, you know, today from the UK, um, we're certainly looking at that recovery period starting hopefully in the first half of next year. We've got to wrap up in about uh, two minutes, so maybe I'll go to, to uh, each of you for about 30 seconds uh, here. And, and Lanny, uh, a, a bit of an opportunity for you just to chime in on that. How optimistic are you sitting there in, in downtown Calgary about a re economic recovery in 2021? And then, Trevin, I'll put a little, little bit of a local twist on that for you since you're in Ottawa. Uh, over to you, Lanny. Well, you know, we're always two hours behind Ottawa or <laughs> a little bit behind Ottawa. Uh, out here in the West, um, it's going to be a tough sl uh, slug for entrepreneurs uh, here in Alberta. We have different difficulties with uh, access to markets, access to capital that are that small businesses here and, and large businesses, in fact, uh, are experiencing. But I think uh, with the advent of an early rollout of a vaccine, if possible, I think there is some some um view to optimism that we will build back better and we will build back stronger and certainly m p um 
is bullish on 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 building out in Canada and uh, supporting business all across the country in the various in various industries and sectors. As MNP has done through the whole pandemic. And thirty seconds to you, Trevin, and I'll just put that a little bit more of a local uh, spin on it. As I indicated, the federal government has such a massive presence here in Ottawa. You know, from a, a jobs point of view, but also you know the, all of the spillover. Um, should we be concerned about the level of federal, uh, the size of the deficit uh, annual, the, the size of the debt, and what that could mean to Ottawa in the next couple of years? So I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned, all spending isn't created equal. And so the actual number itself, obviously, is is, is huge. Um, but it will depend what it's going to be spent on looking forward as well. You know, if it's spent on the things that produce economic growth, that produce business investment, um, then, you know, we're, we're certainly not at that red line yet. Um, but it will depend exactly on where that money goes, not necessarily just the money going out itself. Um, we still don't have those details yet. We'll probably get an indication in what Building Back Better will look like in, in next year's budget. Um, when it comes to Ottawa, what's what's very interesting is that if I'm looking at the drivers of growth next year, um, you know, consumption is, is supposed to increase and consumption took a very big hit this year, but that's supposed to be the driver of growth next year. Um, but government spending is, is going to be a huge driver of growth, uh, you know, next year and probably the year after when it comes to projections. Um, so, you know, that could certainly have a positive impact on the Ottawa economy. On the flip side, what actually really concerns me um, is that business investment is supposed to remain anemic over the next year or two. And that's why it's so important that we put in place those policies that will help us grow our economy, help businesses start to reopen, because that's really what, what a true economic recovery is going to have to look like. Uh, well, we've hit our deadline. Uh, Lanny, I'm going to say thanks. Thanks to you. We uh, love the fact that you joined us from Calgary today. Appreciate the support of MMP. So bye to you, Lanny. And uh, Trevin, please continue your your great work and uh, everything the Canadian Chamber of Commerce is doing. Such an important organization these days. Thanks for joining us, uh, Trevin. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're in the uh, absolute final stretch now of, uh, of today's broadcast. And uh, as we conclude, let me uh, bring back my co-host, Su Ling. Hello, Hello Su Ling. Excellent of, panel. Yeah, you had a little bit of a coffee break there. Good to have you back. <laughs> so um, we're going to wrap up in a, in a couple minutes here, Su Ling. But any final thoughts in what you've heard either from the minister, uh, from the Q&A session, from Gavin, or uh, the panel? Well, I, I think what I would share as my key takeaway from today, uh, Michael, is what I've been saying all along is that it's impressive for us to see the leadership that uh, we've seen both in our local businesses, like our friends at MMP and Impact Affairs, um, as well as um, in our government officials and their willingness to work together. And I think that will be the key in moving us forward. Um, I just, I mean, we're very impressed with the work that uh, Dr. Stratton has done on behalf of the business community in Canada. We've really sure. relied on their expertise and it's easy to see that he has some very clear, you know, opinions on, on how the government can uh, support the economic recovery and that it's not just a spending issue. It's a targeted spending issue and it's a policy. Uh, it's a chance to look at how policy can inspire growth. And so, uh, yeah, we continue to work uh, with the team at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and that will be an important part of it, but also how businesses engage in that economic recovery as well. Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's going to be a little bit murky, but as you said, everyone's in the same rowboat. We seem to be rowing in the right direction, Su Ling. So uh, we can at least be optimistic about that and uh, the progress being made, uh, you know, on a vaccine. As as you indicated, you know, we need to solve the health problem before uh, the economic problem will be um, completely resolved. So uh, listen, we're going to conclude and I want to recognize uh, our two main sponsors today. Once again, we have the uh, great support of MNP uh, which has partnered on this event uh, for many years. Also, the great people led by uh, Hugh at uh, Impact Public Affairs. Uh, thanks again to Hugh and your team, uh, Kyle and Madison, that su help support this event. Our global event partner, Oakwood Design and Build, uh, supporting all of our range of activities here at Ottawa Business Events in this in this new virtual event. 
And uh, one final note as we wrap up. So this video will be available almost immediately for replay. You can visit the OBJ YouTube channel or Facebook channel, or you can head over to the Board of Trade Facebook channel. Uh, that brings us to the uh, end of today's event. We wish you uh, all the best. Please stay, stay safe and strong. We hope to see you real soon. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you.